We know that the solar eclipses only happen during a new moon and that there is a new moon every month. But the moon's tilted orbit shifts so that the moon doesn't always pass in front of the sun. So how does anyone know when an invisible moon will turn day into night? Some old farmers can predict the weather just by looking at the sky. I think it's going to rain. So many ancient people knew by watching where the phases of the moon appeared on the sky. The sun's path along the ecliptic always travels through the zodiacal constellations. Perhaps they could tell by how near or how far each phase was to the ecliptic. Another way might be to watch the full moon. We know the moon crosses the ecliptic twice a month. If the moon crosses the ecliptic when it's full, we know the new moon will be near the ecliptic two weeks later. But in the city, with buildings and trees, we hardly notice the motions of the sun, much less the moon. Some people with south-facing windows let the low winter sun warm their homes. This is called passive solar heating. Some have resident astronomers at home to help track the motions of the winter sun. But in summer, when the sun is high, a tree may shade the house. Its leaves cool the air and convert enough greenhouse carbon dioxide into oxygen for two of us to breathe. But that doesn't help us predict an eclipse. A sundial might help. During the summer, the high summer sun casts a shadow curving down like this. And during the winter, the low winter sun casts a shadow like this. During the equinoxes, the gnomon's shadow moves straight across. Since the full moon is on the opposite side of the Earth from the new moon and sun, it path resembles the sun in the opposite season. When the gnomon's shadow cast by the full moon is on the winter side of the equinox line and the gnomon's shadow cast by the sun is exactly opposite on the summer side of the equinox line, we know the new moon will be near the sun two weeks later. But better still, we could find a level horizon out in the country and set posts where the sun and the full moon rise. The sun rises furthest north on the summer solstice around June 21st. Spring and autumn equinoxes, the sun rises due east and sets due west. Winter solstice, a few days before Christmas, the sun rises lowest in the sky. The full moon rises like this. When it rises at a mirror image, the same distance from the equinox as the sun, we know the new moon will be near the sun's path. When the full moon rises furthest north, farther than any sunrise, we know the new moon will rise too far south to block the sun. It takes 18.6 years for the moon's tilted orbit to shift all the way around, long enough for posts to rot or rust away. So stones set in the ground instead might be better. It's still done for fun in Southeast Asia with the help of a few hundred friends. It's done, it might look like a place on a hill in Salisbury, England.
At Stonehenge, the Great Trilathon watches the summer sun rise over the heel stone. There are places to stand to see the major and minor standstills of the moon. The lesser trilithons line up much the same. 30 sarsen stones count the days between full moons. But what are the 56 round holes filled with white chalk that glow like full moons between the grass? Starting at our August 21st, 2017 eclipse, let's count back 56 full moons and let's see what happens. Hmm, nothing. But if we count back twice, there was something. A partial lunar eclipse on August 16th, 2008. It's true, there were witnesses. If we count two more circuits, we find a total solar eclipse on August 11th, 1999, and two more circuits, another lunar eclipse, August 6th, 1990, and another two, another solar eclipse. But those northerners had watched the sky for a long time. Across the Irish Sea are Hobbit Hills. One had a long hall that let in only the equinox morning sunrise. It was once decorated with chalk spheres like shining stars and a stone at the end of the hall covered with suns and stars. In another is a stone that records a partial solar eclipse that occurred on November 30th, 3340 BC. Today, computers can tell us where the sun and moon were in the sky 5,000 years ago. But 4,000 years ago, computers looked like this. The Chinese also recorded eclipses meticulously, but the burning of the books in 213 BC extinguished over 2,000 years of Chinese history. Yet the story of the two royal astronomers, Xi and Ho, miraculously escaped the flames. The story goes, in the autumn of 2137 BC, during the reign of Chung Kung, there was an eclipse of the sun. The sun and moon did not meet harmoniously in Fang, meaning it was an annual eclipse, Following the chaotic custom of beating drums and gongs and shooting arrows at the moon to frighten away the dragon that was swallowing the sun. Astronomers' duties included chasing dragons in those days. We are told Xi and Ho indulged themselves in drinking. Chung Kang sent a prince Ying to lead the imperial forces to punish Xi and Ho. The documents include an ominous proclamation. Whosoever advances or sets back the march of time shall be put to death. But an eclipse neither advances or retards the march of time, so why did Chung Kang punish Xi and Ho? Was it because the emperor only heard about the eclipse from the commotion outside instead of from his royal astronomers? Or because Xi and Ho neglected their duties and the eclipse was the last straw? Or because the day didn't turn into night? The moon covered 97 and one half percent of the sun, but the sun is so bright that the sky was still as light as 2500 full moons. When Prince Yin came, Xi and Ho, like wooden statues, neither saw or understood anything. If Xi and Ho had measured the size of the full moon two weeks earlier, they would have seen that it was unusually large, nearest the Earth, in its elliptical orbit. They would have known that two weeks later the new moon would appear very small when it was furthest from the Earth. If a full moon looks like the one on the right, can you tell if a solar eclipse would be total or annular two weeks later? There may not even have been an eclipse where Xi and Ho were drinking. 
By their negligence in calculating and observing the movement of the stars, they violated the law of death promulgated by our earlier princes. Tsi and Ho came to a sad end. Although Tsi and Ho are gone, the story of their eclipse is remembered and reminds us to be careful of our behavior lest we reach the last straw. In 1938, a farmer plowing his field in Syria, overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, accidentally struck an ancient tomb in which there were clay tablets. Later, hundreds more were found, recording very normal things. The recipes of Ugaritit alphabet, a note to Tutankhamun, and a song to the wife of the moon god. On one was written, In the sixth hour of the day of the month of Hiaru, the sun was put to shame and went down in the daytime. Resef was in attendance. Haruspicium was performed. At first it was thought to have happened on May 3rd, 1373 BC. But the wording is so specific that it was soon found to be March 5th, 1223 BC. The sixth hour on a sundial would have made it early afternoon. The month of Hiaru was on our late February and early March. Resef was the name of the planet Mars. Can you guess what happened on March 5th, 1223 BC at 2.20 p.m. over Ugarit? Do you see if Mars close to the sun? Haruspicium was a type of divination to see if the eclipse were a good omen or a bad one. He warned. This suggests that the omen was considered not so good. Ugarit was a lovely place to live, overlooking the waves breaking on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. But just as happens to many cities, it was destroyed by the marauding sea people just three decades later. But it was a good omen too, for its records, not to mention a little duck, survived over 3,000 years. Babylonian records are so accurate that scientists could use them to fine-tune their computer models for rotation and orbit rates of the Earth and Moon over 3,000 years later. Such careful records of eclipses were kept all over ancient Babylonia that they noticed each returned after 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours. Since the Saros, this cycle, of 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours wasn't even a number of days, those additional 8 hours meant the Earth would turn another 8 hours to meet the eclipse. The eclipse would be 120 degrees further west. Babylonians were predicting eclipses all around the world that even were invisible in Babylon itself. More amazing is that there are not just one, but dozens of Sarah cycles. Today there are 41 known, each representing every 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours. Between 2001 and 2025 there will be many of these eclipses. So the Babylonians could not simply be counting, they must have known the sky very well. Four eclipses happened in the year of Ugarit's eclipse. A partial lunar eclipse two weeks later on March 19th. An annular solar eclipse on August 28th. And two weeks after that, a partial eclipse of the moon on September 13th over Ugarit, belonging to a different Saros. The time between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse of the same as Saros cycle is half a Saros, 112 full moons, the same as two cycles around Stonehenge's Aubrey holes. Small wonder they needed 56 chalk holes at Stonehenge. If there were stones on the chalk spots, each moved with every full moon, it must have made a marvelous eclipse clock. Both the Babylonians and the Brits were truly amazing at what they did. Fortunately, some eclipses bear good tidings. One eclipse ended a war and began a marriage. In ancient Turkey, Lydia was always magical. 
the Pactolos River washed so much electrum gold down Mount Tmolos, rumor was King Midas had bathed there to rid of the golden touch. The first coins were struck of this natural alloy of silver and gold, some with the name of Aliatus. King Aliatus and his son Croesus used their wealth well. They invited the wisest men to visit them, from the seven sages of Greece to a dark ex-slave named Aesop. The sage Thales knew Egyptian geometry, Babylonian astronomy, and could find his way in the dark by the stars, and tell the height of an Egyptian pyramid by comparing the height of its shadow to his own. Can you? He also predicted an eclipse, but the Lydians were too busy fighting the Medes to pay attention. Herodotus tells the story of the May 28th, 585 BC eclipse. The Howley's River was the place in which it happened. When the fight began to grow fierce, suddenly the day became night. The Lydians and the Medes, when they saw that it had become night instead of day, ceased from their fighting and were eager, both of them, that peace should be made. And those who brought about the peace decided that Aliatus should give his daughter Arianis to Astyagus, the son of Sixares, in marriage to strengthen the truce. When Croesus became king, he had time to get back to supporting wise men. His alchemist learned to separate gold from silver and from the electrum alloy, standardizing the currency, and brought Croesus even greater wealth, along with the expression, as rich as Croesus, which brought about all sorts of things. Diogenes was booted out of Sinope for making too many test cuts in the coins, lived in Athens in a tub, and met Alexander the Great. Alexander asked if Diogenes wanted anything. Yes, said Diogenes. Could you stand a little out of my son? Alexander was so struck by this that he said to his followers, who were laughing and jesting about the philosopher as they went away, but truly, if I were not Alexander, I would be Diogenes. The tomb of Aliatus still stands today near the Sigean Sea. And the king Siaxares is in the mountains of Iraq, as though awaiting another awesome eclipse. And the children remember the swarthy slave Aesop for his wonderful stories like the fox and the grapes. Other sciences advanced in Mesopotamia. Glass beads from both Egypt and Mesopotamia have been found as far north as Denmark. Mesopotamian glass evolved to become objects of great beauty, and later, even more. The Egyptian hieroglyphs for glass also meant luck. It's hard to say if glass was good or bad luck for Joseph von Fraunhofer, who found himself orphaned at age 11, working in a glass shop under a cruel taskmaster who neither let him read nor attend school, until the shop collapsed on him. By the time Joseph was pulled from the rubble, Prince Maximilian and his friend Joseph Urtzschneider had arrived, but after that things began to look up. The prince gave him books, and Joseph Urtzschneider gave him a place in his glassworks at the Binnicht Boyern Abbey. A bit more pleasant than his former shop. Pierre-Louis Guinand, a Swiss glass technician, taught him the secrets of glass making. Joseph was so happy that he set about making the finest glass anywhere. He found the purest inland quartz sand 20 miles south of London and added so much lead oxide to make his heavy flint glass increase its index of refraction. It took on a brownish tint. He combined flint glass with low refracting crown glass to make a double lens to correct for chromatic aberration. He improved lens polishing machine and designed precision instruments, microscopes, 
telescopes, opera glasses, and surveying instruments. For his larger telescopes, he invented an equatorial mount with a clock drive run by weights, like a grandfather clock before electricity, so the stars wouldn't drift out of the field of view as the Earth rotated. His Dorpat telescope was so fine it helped find 3,000 double stars, like the North Star, 2,700 more than ever seen before. While others used flint glass, also called lead crystal, to adorn palaces, Joseph had loftier ideas. He made prisms so perfect, when sunlight shone down on them, he could see dark lines within the sun's spectrum. He noticed that the sodium lines from his lamp matched the dark lines in the solar spectrum. With growing excitement, he tried focusing light from the brightest stars and found that their patterns differed from that of the sun. When mounted on a surveying instrument, he could measure the angles of the different lines and eventually recorded 574 different lines and etched and watercolored a plate to record them. When he learned that shining light through finely spaced tiny wires would create interference patterns making the spectral lines clearer, he tried all sorts of things until successfully scoring a glass plate with 7,671 grooves per inch. Eventually modern diffraction gratings would have as many as 120,000 grooves per inch. Like many glassmakers of his era who were poisoned by heavy metal vapors, Joseph Fraunhofer's health was impaired and he died in 1826 of consumption at the age of 39. From his sickbed, he tried to teach an apprentice all he knew, but many of his secrets are thought to have gone to the grave with him. A prominent French philosopher once said it was too bad that people would never know what chemical elements the stars contained, but he was mistaken. In 1868, scientists flocked to India and Siam to view the August 18th King of Siam eclipse. Some took with them spectroscopes. King Mungkut, the King of Siam, was far wiser and kinder than portrayed in The King and I. He had spent 27 years as a Buddhist monk, found joy at other people's happiness, and valued knowledge above material wealth. While he was king, not only did he bring his country up to the highest possible standards of science and technology, but he himself calculated the exact time and place of the August 18, 1868 eclipse more precisely than the French astronomers, who were so impressed they named the eclipse for him. While the king observed the eclipse with his retinue, astronomers with spectroscopes saw the eclipse like this and saw a bright yellow spectral line, not yet seen on Earth, and named the new element, helium, after Helios, Greek for sun. Sadly, King Monku died two months after the eclipse. He is fondly remembered for his King of Siam eclipse, for being father of science and technology in Siam, and for his many beautiful children. He would have been delighted to have seen what happened next. Not only did spectra tell the composition of stars, but their size, temperature, and brightness and distance as well. The most massive stars' immense gravity caused their atomic fusion to run faster and hotter, producing bluer light with higher frequencies. Using triangles the same way Talus has measured the height of pyramids, people compared the diameter of Earth's orbit to angles measured to the nearest stars to learn their distance. Stars with similar spectra had similar brightness. If a star with the same spectrum as another but appeared one-fourth as bright, it must be twice as distant. A star one-ninth as bright would be three times as distant. A star a sixteenth as bright would be... Can you guess? Stars are measured not only in our own Milky Way galaxy, but in the large and small Magellanic galaxies, approximately 200,000 light-years away. Since Cepheid variable stars in the Magellanic Cloud were all about the same distance, it was learned their brightness could be predicted by how fast they pulsed. When Edwin Hubble found a Cepheid variable in the Andromeda Galaxy with a period of 31.4 days, it appeared 100 times less bright. He knew it must be over 10 times more distance, 2.65 million light years away. Type 1a supernova all have a similar spectral type and are as bright as a whole galaxy. They could be used to calculate the distance to even more remote galaxies. 
In the most distant galaxies, the spectral patterns were there, but they shifted towards longer wavelengths, like a train horn deepens in pitch as it passes and moves away. And when they were so distant, even supernovae were no longer discernible, their distance could be determined by the redshift of the spectra. The more distant the galaxy, the further they shifted towards the red. The whole universe was moving away from itself. The universe was expanding. Light, which seems instantaneous to us, had traveled over 13 billion years. We were seeing back in time for 13 billion years. Young Joseph Fraunhofer, after crawling from beneath a pile of rubble, with the help of a prince, led us not only to the ends of the universe, but to the beginning of time. Albert Einstein played the violin while he wondered about space, time, and light. Was light influenced by gravity? Newton's law of gravitation always contained two masses to have a gravitational attraction. And photons of light have no mass. They are pure energy, so wouldn't light traveling near the sun continue to do so in a straight line? But when a small mass is near a super gigantic one, its motion does not depend much on its own mass at all. So could light bend under the influence of a large massive object, even with no mass itself? Well, maybe. Einstein considered that if an elevator were accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second per second, someone inside would feel the same effect as if standing still on Earth, where gravitation, due to the mass of the Earth, causes falling objects to accelerate 9.8 meters per second per second. If a beam of starlight shone through a rust hole as the elevator zipped past the star, the beam of light wouldn't seem to go straight across to someone inside the elevator. It would bend down, following a curved path. So, wouldn't a beam of light influenced by gravity behave the same way? Well, maybe. What if gravity were not a force, but a curvature of space and time? Then all things would be affected by it. Not just material things, but also light, which we are told has no mass whatsoever. Then light would bend when it would pass the sun. So Einstein plugged the numbers into his formula, and the results were that light would have to bend twice as much as it did in Newton's equation. Which seemed too incredible to be true, so most people thought it nonsense. Until the eclipse of May 29, 1919, Sir Arthur Eddington decided to have a look and find out the truth. He traveled all the way to Principe Island off the west coast of Africa to take a picture of the May 29th, 1919 eclipse to see if the sun would bend starlight. Early in the year, he had made a photographic plate of the sky where the sun would be. Then during the 1919's epic eclipse, while the sun vanished for 6 minutes and 51 seconds, he took another. Afterward, he developed the plate and put it under a microscope the stars had shifted. Einstein was right, and he made some new friends. Sir Arthur Eddington on the right, and next to him Lawrence was one of the few who understood and wrote the Lawrence equations that showed motion in four-dimensional space that included time and gravity. Gravity had warped space-time, and was doing it every day. Not only around the sun, but around galaxies, and clusters of distant galaxies, and black holes. and colliding black holes. But the best eclipse is the one you see. We are lucky to have three eclipses nearby. The first came on August 21st, 2017. Another one will come April 8th, 2024.
And if you can wait another 21 years, you may see one with your children, or your grandchildren, or your great-grandchildren, on August 12, 2045. What will you do for the next eclipse? Will you watch the moon's shadow on a sundial, or see how close each phase of the moon is to the ecliptic, or measure how large the moon is, or mark where it rises on the horizon? Will you be there on the farm with the animals who watch the sky, and birds who sing and then bed down for the night? Or will you sing for the moon?
Still the 